it works. Okay, right, thank you. Well, the school bell is run. Uh, there will be food remaining later on and coffee, I dare say. And we have some very interesting stalls here in which some retail therapy can be uh, applied. Uh, for example, the University of Wales Press has a wonderful collection of rare and valuable collector's items, books on the history of science in Wales. And you can find out more about that series by talking to Cleon um, and so on. So let me draw attention, first of all, to the practicalities. Um, we have a panel and you have a program. <coughs> the program will list in order the uh, presentations by each of the panel members. Indeed, there's even a, a time allocated to that. And we're hoping to try to keep the time because in doing one of these meetings with so many different parts of the um, uh, sort of uh, subject to cover, we have six panel members. Uh, and I'm sure you can read about their biographies in the program and also they can introduce themselves uh, as they present. One thing I should draw attention to, of course, is the fact that I should welcome all newcomers to the Bay Campus of Swansea University. If you have uh, not been here before, I hope you uh, take a good look. And indeed, there's a bit of a tour organized later, which you can find out about from the, the, uh, the registra registration desk. This meeting is actually organized by uh, Academia Europea. And uh, I would like to say a few words about uh, what, what this organization is. It was founded um, 30 years ago in 1988 to be a, an unusual thing, and that is a continental <coughs> learned society or national academy or a continental academy, because it was designed to serve the academic community across all of continental Europe, not just the European Union. So it's coming up to its birthday on the 5th of September, uh, when it will be 30 years old. It was founded uh, essentially in London and in Cambridge, I think. Ola, you were there in Cambridge. Um, so it has a, a, a British, a British um, uh, origin in, in that sense. The society covers all academic subjects and is exclusively interested essentially in, in research, broadly conceived, and it has four sectors, humanities, social sciences, exact sciences, and life sciences. Um, the current president is Sir Cleo of Utrecht University, and uh, the uh, vice president and treasurer is Ola Peterson, who is with us today, and will be talking shortly. There are 4,000 fellows in this continental learned society, of which um, there are 70 Nobel laureates and a vast collection of individuals who've done all kinds of important things in their research from virtually all the countries that make up contemporary Europe in the geographical sense. Um, you might be interested in this. I've just looked up 665 members in the United Kingdom, and there are 18 members in Wales. So that is our, 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 our society here. And so without further ado, I'd like to begin the meeting and uh, invite you to, to welcome Professor Peter Halligan. Just oh. start with some housekeeping. Oh, is this all about <laughs> toilets and <laughs> things is of this kind? Here? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's loud enough. Okay. Um, so, we don't expect the fire alarm to go off, but if it does, please vacate the building through either of these doors, and uh, the meeting point is just that side of the building. The, there's going to be a tour of the campus, so if you've not seen the Bay developments, then we offer a tour at 2 o'clock. Um, which is conducted by the Head of Innovation here at Swansea, Professor uh, Hans uh, Saints. Saints? Saints? Yeah. So please remain in the room if you'd like to go on that tour and see the rest of the campus. There is a cafe uh, where you can get a very nice cup of tea and coffee at the end, which is open until 3 o'clock, with a lovely sea view. So I've been up there, I recommend it. Um, we are going to live stream the events uh, up until the debate, so we're going to record the speakers for a worldwide audience, but any kind of audience interaction at the end will not be recorded, so please be as free as you like with your comments because nobody else will hear outside of this room. I think that's it. Thank you to Swansea for hosting the event. Right, yes. <laughs> 
Uh, and one thing I should have mentioned about the uh, Academia Europea, which I, I forgot, is that it operates, its headquarters is still in London, but in particular it operates through various hubs. And the UK has a hub and it is based at Cardiff and has therefore a very important and influential uh, set of opportunities for people to take an interest in the work of the society, which of course is on a continental basis. And with that, let me introduce Professor Peter Hallecker. Sorry, um, I could have gone to my slides. Oh, thank you very much for this opportunity to um, come and contribute today. Um, I'm the new Chief Scientific Advisor for Wales, and I'm in this post now six months. So some of the reflections I'm going to give you relate to my experience over the last couple of um, weeks in terms of getting to know a little bit about this post, but also some of the interactions I have with other um, colleagues across the, um, the United Kingdom and then further afield. Um, one of the things I'm going to focus on is a UK perspective, because that's which the role I currently occupy fits in with. But also I'm going to give you a little bit more, spend a bit more time maybe on, rather than others who will talk about specific policies, talk about the infrastructure that's related to these things. Um, okay, so from a kick-off point of view, it's clearly the case that science is making great strides with regard to embedding itself increasingly in society, rather than the perception in the past, to some extent, that it was standing apart from it in ivory towers. It's considered by a lot of the general public and um, politicians as being much now a, um, a vehicle for utilitarian usage, rather than this idea that it's somewhere farmed out and uh, research is generated and um, publications are generated to follow. Um, it's increasingly understood, despite the recent challenges with regard to popularist approach and post-normal science, as it were, that the explosion of science and other forms of information out there and the pace of information is a great opportunity, but also the challenge is how you synthesize that and bring it into government and other sources. And what I mean by science advice is basically the harnessing and synthesizing of scientific knowledge in support of public decision making. Now, obviously, um, one can actually apply the term science to a whole gamut of, of areas, and it's really interesting in terms of my few, few, first few months in this job is the discussions I have with across government. And my argument is that there is very few domains of government that don't have, actually have a, a relevance for science. But these are some of the highlights that obviously many of you will be aware of, um, and increasingly it's the case that science applies itself uh, without apology with regard to these areas. But science informing policy with regard to that, there's, there's a lot of interest with regard to a whole ecosystem, and I'll highlight that in terms of the ones I'm familiar with at the moment. But policy making, I think we should always bear in mind, as opposed to advice giving, is actually choosing options with different implications for different groups of stakeholders. And as elected officials, there's a different lens um, that sometimes that those politicians, who are the decision makers with regard to this, have to make. Having said that, there's a growing interest, growing demand in translating science to inform. And many governments, and I'll tell you a little bit more about that, have appointed science advisors or councils or a variety of vehicles to help inform policy and decision making in the belief that an accurate unbiased synthesis of relevant science evidence is one of the most valuable contributions a research community can offer to democratically elected decision makers. That's the theory. Practice is a little bit more challenging. But in terms of general public surveys, I think this is useful in its own right, they are appreciative of the fact that politicians should rely more on advice from expert scientists. Now, it's, it's, we're going through changing times, and this is a recent report 
from the Centre for Science and Democracy indicating what happens when you give up a little bit on the science advice. And this is a report in January 2018 indicating in the United States evidence from the Trump administration sidelining some of the science advisory committees and a changing with regard to the membership of those particular committees. Um, but my structure of my particular presentation today is three things. I'm going to say a little bit about the key actors with regard to it, particularly on the UK focus. I'm talking about the idea, some of the insights I've derived in terms of influencing policy within Wales, and then some practical observations regarding science advice. Peter Gluckman, uh, he's retiring as the Chief Scientific Advisor for New Zealand. As a small country, I always look at small countries and how they do their work because it's always useful in terms of translating that to a, a small nation like Wales as well. And he suggested that the key actors in a science advisory system go from well-trained scientists to universities, government scientists, regulatory agencies, advisory committees, professional bodies, national academies, departmental CSAs and a government CSA as his was his position. Peter has been a great exponent to some extent of how a chief scientific advisor can actually proselytize the message and has organized a whole variety of international events and one in 2014 which has gone on to set up its own particular organization. But in terms of the science advice ecosystem, I would describe it as kind of four at the moment, but I suspect you could get more. So the first ones, what I'm more familiar with in the United Kingdom, and I guess most of you here, are the chief scientific advisors. And this goes back to the US in 1957, and subsequently in the UK um, in the 1960s. But this is true of many countries like Australia, Canada, Cuba, and so forth. Then there's advisory councils. They can run. They're not mutually exclusive. You can have CSAs as well. Alongside that, in the United Kingdom, we have the UK Science and Technology Council. There's a variety of councils, and these sometimes feed in very strongly into the um, the executive and the prime ministers and so forth. Then we have national academies, and in fact national academies have been doing this for longer than most, and we have the Royal Society, British Academy, Royal Academy of Engineering, the Academy of Medical Sciences. But let's not forget also, uh, both in Wales, the Learned Society and the Royal Society of Edinburgh, in terms of one of their remits with regard to contributing in terms of their mandate, in terms of the reasons why they're there. And then there's the supranatural, the, the one, supranatural, uh, in terms of the, um, the organisational structure that's been set up by the European Commission, which I think Ole will talk more about, so I won't say very much about. But this, there are also another organisation which I recently had the opportunity to present at in Tallinn, the European Science Advisors Forum, and this was set up by Anne Glover in 2014, and has continued to get strong support with regard to the European Commission going forward. And then finally, there's the International Network for Government Science Advice that Peter Luckman has set up. <coughs> The European Science Advisor Forum is getting its second wind. It was set up in 2014. Its remit in terms of reference is highlighted there. Um, and at the recent meeting, I had an opportunity to meet with the um, chair of the European Group of Scientific Advisors, but also senior members of the cabinet with regard to Car Carlos Modej. Um, they're very interested in democratizing the idea that particularly the Eastern European countries would have opportunities to have science advice with regard to their governments. The UK system, as I indicated, has there's a whole range of uh, actors, and if you're interested, look up the CASE website, which has got a very good review of that. I'm going to focus particularly on the UK Government Office for Science, because that's the one that I've interacted with. Now, some people will argue to some extent that there are differential aspects with regard to science advice being given. And this is a paper from Hutching and Stenseth in 2016 looking at the models of communication. And as you can see on the um, left-hand side, there's a list of the potential sources of advice. And obviously they're slightly biased in the sense that they put the CSA at the top of that with regard to it. But they're also looking at the general likelihood of science advice being independent, objective, considered by cabinet, used to inform policy and so forth. So this is, I, this is an interpretation by them, but it gives you an idea of the different players and the potential as adjudicated with regard to this particular paper in terms of science advice being provided and the various criteria that they're being put forward. The UK Government of Science basically is the, it's, it's about 100 staff, it's based in Bayes, and it actually provides uh, input into the Council for Science and Technology, which is on the left-hand side, which the um, CSA is the co-chair, and they feed back straight up into the Cabinet Secretary and in terms of the Prime Minister. 
Um, the CSA, the Government for Science, um, uh, he heads the Government for Science office, and basically he provides to some extent what other departmental and devolved CSA do in terms of providing and evaluating and challenging and scrutinizing the types of advice. But the other thing to mention is the fact that he heads up a network of which I'm part of. So Patrick Valance is the current Government Chief Scientific Advisor. He's a medic from SmithKline. Uh, Beecham, and he, um, the, the remit of Ghost Science, as you can see there, is very much to some extent the same remit of departmental and devolved, giving science advice to Prime Minister uh, through a program of projects and so forth, ensuring the quality of those, um, that, that advice. The UK has a well-regarded system. It goes back almost um, uh, 1964 to Sir Solly Zuckerman. And the position was set up deliberately to be apolitical and independent with regard to it. This is the network that maybe people are not familiar with, that, that um, Patrick sits uh, and I attend on a regular basis up in London at Bayes. So you have a whole variety of departmental CSAs there, which is even Treasury has a CSA and the... Um, the exiting department with Brexit has a CSA. But the big departments here are obviously health and the MOD, which could have budgets of <coughs> maybe several billions. Um, but it's really interesting to see that there's, there's no shortage. And in fact, at the moment, Patrick was giving advice to the um, Parliamentary Select Committee recently, and his, his aim is to get more science advisors in all the departments with regard to the UK government. So the structure with regard to the UK government, you've government chief scientific advisor, you've got about 20 to 25 regarding departmental or devolved with regard to it. And then there's a whole variety of engineering and science uh, colleagues that are involved in uh, providing advice. And then you move out into the advisory council and the wider scientific community. In Scotland, the chief scientific advisor there is Sheila Rowan. She was appointed before I was. And... Um, She's in a part-time capacity, she's a physicist, and she also works very closely with the Scottish Science Advisory Council, which is their highest advisory body. They also have two other CSAs, one in rural affairs and one in, in health. In Wales, it's really interesting. Scotland appointed their first CSA in 2006. Ireland followed in 2007. I've indicated that the government chief advisor for the United Kingdom goes back to the 1960s. And then Rodri Morgan appointed uh, Professor John Harries in uh, 2010, and that was followed then by Julie Williams. And I took up the position in, in March of this year. The key the driver with regard to the role is to provide top quality scientific advice to the First Minister, Cabinet and Administration, and to ensure that the government policies and decisions are informed by scientific evidence. To do that, I'm refreshing the uh, advisory body, which is now going to be called the Wales Science and Innovation Advisory Council, and I have Sir John O'Reilly, the former Director General of uh, Knowledge and Innovation UK, and um, the, uh, I think he's a Vice Chancellor at uh, Cranfield as well, and he <coughs> works in Singapore as the co-chair. I've also set up a science strategy group, which is an opportunity to bring different networks within the variety of scientists that currently work within the uh, Welsh Government, including the Chief Medical Officer, Chief Statistician, Chief Veterinary Officer, and so forth. And then I link up with the UK Government Chief Scientific Advisor and the, the UK CSA network. Wales is interesting in as, in as much as, as you probably know, and Treasury was pushing for this in terms of demonstrating the research as an impact other than publication. And with regard to the last REF, Wales did very well, and we didn't crow about it the way I think we should have. And to some extent, um, the Learned Society was very instrumental here in making it more available in terms of the public point of view. But if you can actually see the breakdown here in terms of outputs, you can see the differences are not great. But when you come to impact, you can see that nearly 50% of those 276 impact cases were rated as four star. Now that is something impressive given there was no rule book to start with regard to that. And this is not publications, this is the effect of those, the impact of those. And that was authored, if you're interested, and it's, it's available, I think, on the uh, Learned Society website. But it's a report that was commissioned through King's College, who did the original analysis of the 7,000 impact cases with regard to the United Kingdom. And it's, it's an authoritative report that demonstrates the range of benefits. And if you a quick summary of those with regard to Wales, if you actually look at the impact types, they look with regard to shaping government, national, international policy, and not just Welsh, Welsh 
policy from that point of view, but also influencing policy recommendations, informing strategy and so forth. Six months on, some practical observations. The CSA does not make policy decisions. It's really important from that point of view. Um, I can expect to inform policy, but not to make it, but I have to persuade ministers in a variety of different areas that science is actually relevant rather than the quote-unquote the usual suspects. And as, as advice, it can be ignored. After all, it's, it's advice. But I'm perceived to, and I, from my point of view, I'm trying to demonstrate that in terms of integrity, to act as a broker, not an advocate, because I think the trust is very much important and has to be maintained if a science advisor or advisor committee acts as a knowledge broker and, uh, rather than as an advocate. It's important in maintaining scientific credibility with politicians and scientists alike. And I think it's important to point out you can't always resolve value conflicts through appeal to facts alone. In providing cross-cutting advice, I take it from all across the sciences in the most general usage of that term, okay, from my natural, physical and so forth, but I'll also take it from the social sciences and humanities if relevant. One of the things I think it's important to remember is we often talk about the idea of supply. That is, we have the information, we have the science, we want to provide it with regard to it. But the demand side and looking at the, the, the vagaries and the challenges is equally important. And what I've been able to discern from other colleagues is policymakers have limited bandwidth, often limited, and often limits the maneuverability that they can do. The policy cycle is generally short as opposed to long term. You can see that in the Wellbeing and Future Generations Act. More relevant science, most relevant science is not complete and sometimes it's ambiguous and policymakers are not there to act as referees with regard to this. Finally, science advice itself is beginning to become a field of academic study, generating new theories and conceptual models and we're at the start of that and I think it'll grow and there's a, there's a great appetite for this both in terms of general public and I think increasingly uh, as demonstrated in some of the democratic governments. Thank you. Our next speaker is uh, Professor Ortiz. I can find my slides. So, the Science Advice Europe-wide is actually organized very differently from what it is in the UK. So, what I say will be quite contrasting to what Peter has just talked about, because while originally the European Commission had a similar system with the Chief Scientific Advisor and Glover, who was mentioned by, by, by Peter, the Juncker Commission, when it came in, decided to do it in a very different way. So that's a very, I think, interesting experiment, which is still very new. So what the Commission decided was to ask five pan-European organizations, and you have them here, Academia Europea, and John already said a few words about it, and I'll say a little bit more about that. Uh, all European academies, <coughs> ESAC, European Academy of Science Advisory Council, Euro case, which is the Europe-wide engineering uh, organization, and FEAM or FEM, Federation of European Academies of Medicine. So the Commission, in a sense, you might say arbitrarily, decided that these five pan-European organizations should be charged with organizing science advice to the Commission. And so we then created this organization. SAPIR, standing for Science Advice for Policy by European Academies. And it started formally uh, in 2016, really only got underway in 2017. It's one of the earliest meetings we had with uh, the Commissioner for Research and Innovation, Carlos Moitas. You could call him the sort of science minister for, for, for Europe. It's a complicated mechanism because it is not only SAPIR that is involved in it, 
there is a group which was originally called the high-level group, and there are quite a few representatives of the high-level group also in this picture. They have been recently renamed the group of chief scientific advisors. So we don't have one chief scientific advisor. We have a group of chief scientific advisors, seven of them. They don't cover all specialties, and hence the need for the broader mechanisms appear. And the third part of the science advice mechanism is a substantial science advice mechanism unit in Brussels, headed by Johannes Klompers, who is almost not seen here. And they, so to speak, mediate between the group of chief scientific advisors and SAPEA. So I will focus attention on SAPEA here because that, in a sense, is the most unusual type of mechanism. So what the Commission decided was that they would like to have a very broad-based system that grew, as it were, from the grassroots of scientists and therefore would encompass the broad view of experts within uh, the European Union. Now, as I say, these organizations are somewhat different in character, but the one that is different from all the other ones is actually Academia Europea. The other ones are kind of federations. So all European academies has as members a number of national academies. So the Royal Society is a member, the British Academy uh, is, is a member. ESAC also is a federation, but only of science academies, does not encompass the humanities. Eurocase, as I say, is the engineers, and uh, FEM are the uh, medical uh, academies of Europe. Academia Europea is an academy like the Royal Society or like many of the other uh, science academies we have in Europe. So it's an individual academy that elects members on the basis of uh, uh, scientific excellence. And I'll just say a few additional words about Academia Europea. As John uh, said, it uh, celebrates actually 30th anniversary. Interestingly enough, it is by far the oldest of the five pan-European networks that are involved in the science advice mechanism because most of the federal organizations have actually only been established in fairly uh, recent times. So just a few things that comes from this meeting that we are going to have in a few weeks. Uh, Venki Ramakrishnan, who is the current president of the Royal Society, has on several occasions, I've heard him speak about the importance of Europe as a scientific power. He mentions the point that when he was a young uh, person in India and thinking about where to go and do his research, there was no doubt in his mind it had to be the U.S. And he did, in fact, go to the U.S., of course, and, and did uh, the work for which he got a Nobel Prize uh, to a large extent there. But he makes the point that this has changed in the last 10 years and that now worldwide Europe is seen as as strong a science environment as, as, as the U.S. So it is a terrific scientific power. And of course, the science support at the moment embedded in the Horizon 2020, of course, will go on in the new framework program, is the largest single science support program uh, worldwide. So there's no other program that has the breadth and the uh, amount of money. And actually, that brings me to the person who has, in a sense, been responsible uh, for this, which is uh, uh, the administrator, uh, Robert Jan Smits, who will be getting the gold medal from the Academy in, in a few weeks' time, <coughs> who has just retired from being the uh, Director General of uh, the Commission's Research and Innovation Directorate, and who is now the Commission's Open Access Envoy. Uh, the Commission places an enormous emphasis on, on, on open access, and we may want to, to discuss that, that, that later. And as you see, the title of Robert Jan Smith, uh, I like the title here for his talk in a couple of weeks' time, Science, <coughs> Europe's Most Precious Asset. And I think that is actually uh, the, the case. In all this, of course, it's a bit of a tragedy what is happening with Brexit, because Britain is probably the strongest scientific power <coughs> in Europe at the moment, although sometimes I think we underestimate the quality of science that is done in many other countries in Europe. But even so, from all the many indicators, 
Britain is a very strong science country, and uh, I know also uh, Venky Ramakrishnan regards it as a potential tragedy if we crash out of the European Union in a hard Brexit. It would <coughs> cause colossal damage to Britain, but also to Europe as a whole. Now back to the uh, SAPIA mechanism. So you could, I mean, there's no question, of course, that scientific <coughs> evidence is needed for policy making, and uh, Peter already talked about this. But you can always do it in different ways. You could ask, of course, academics have to be involved in scientific advice making. Where else would it come from? But does it need to come from academies? Traditionally, academies have played a long role. The Royal Society was founded in 1660, so it has a very, very long history. And similar science academies in Germany and France have a similar age. So some of the advantages we think, those of us who are involved in SAPIR, is contained in this slide here, namely that they are independent, self-governing institutions who, in that sense, are not beholden to any kind of commercial interests. They contain obviously academic expertise, and they have, because of their very long uh, traditions of excellence and recognition in their individual countries, a considerable convening power. And the idea of the SAPIA mechanism is in the sense that while the five networks I mentioned are charged with organizing it, they, of course, each of them have members that are belonging to a lot of other academies. So in that sense, a very large network is available for providing the advice. It's just a question of organizing it in such a way that it actually becomes available to the policy makers. So academies throughout Europe, including, of course, the Learner Society of Wales, have the opportunity to participate in many of the projects that SAPIA deals with. Member academies can suggest scientific topics, they can nominate fellows for the working groups that are established for each project. We'll come to that in a moment. There are possibilities for hosting working group meetings. They could, in principle, also act as lead academies for a particular scientific topic. Outreach events can be hosted. There is money in the program for that. And in general, the different organizations in, in, in Europe can raise the visibility of academy work at a European level. Just now, there are particular opportunities because we are obviously getting towards the end of the current Commission's uh, life, and a lot of work is going on in terms of thinking about how to maybe tweak the SAPIA mechanism and make it uh, even better than it is at the moment. So what has <laughs> actually been done so far? As I say, it's fairly new. It only got really started in 2017. So the principal task of the SAPIA mechanism is to provide evidence review reports. So these are reports that bring together scientific evidence in a particular area, typically in response to a question from one of the commissioners. So the very first one, which actually was led by Academia Europea, and for which Louis Edwards, who you saw before, uh, did uh, an enormous amount of uh, work keeping the whole thing together, was food from the oceans. So the question that came from the Commissioner for Maritime Affairs was, how can we extract more food from the oceans in a sustainable manner? Very, very important question for the globe, actually, because at the moment we are only getting a very small fraction of our calorie intake from the oceans. There is not a lot of scope, actually, for improving uh, farming. It's already close to capacity. So clearly, as the population is increasing dramatically, one has to ask the question, where does the additional food to come from? And actually, the one place where it can come from uh, is, is the oceans. So a very substantial report was uh, produced, uh, more than 160 pages. A working group was set up, international working group. And at the end of 2017, this report was handed over to the Commission. And on the basis of that evidence review report, the group of chief scientific advisors then formulates the actual specific advice to the Commission. So this has been done. It's still too early to say what finally will come out of it in terms of Commission policy decisions, but that is, in a way, encapsulate the process. Two other evidence review reports have been delivered this year, uh, novel carbon capture 
and utilization technologies, and a third one, which is in a politically very sensitive area on uh, <laughs> pesticides or plant protection products, has also been uh, produced. These reports have been, so far all we can say is that they have been well received by the Commission. The Commission has repeatedly declared that these evidence review reports are very useful. The group of chief scientific advisors feel that these evidence review reports give them a firm grounding for making their opinions. And what is important about SAPIR is that all these documents are in the public domain. And this is the chief difference between the different systems that existed before in the Barroso Commission where our chief scientific advisor simply gave advice to the Commission, which was not in the public domain. And particularly green groups and so on complained vociferously that they did not know what the scientific advice was and therefore felt. And that was one of the reasons that the Commission decided to create this new system. So the evidence review reports are in the public domain. The group of chief scientific advisors advice is in the public domain. And then it is up to the politicians to do it. And just at the very last moment, so these are the projects that we are currently working on. As I said before, most of the projects come from the Commission, which is reasonable. However, we also have the opportunity in SAPEA to do so-called bottom-up pro projects. So people can suggest that this would be something that the Commission ought to know about, even though they haven't actually asked for the advice. And that's part of the contract, as it were. And this topic, transforming the future of aging, is actually the first bottom-up topic from, from, from SAPEA. And we are currently working, particularly Academia Europea, on this project, which again, uh, Luis is uh, uh, in practice uh, leading, making sense of science under conditions of complexity and uncertainty, and that's another unusual one, because that came from the group of chief scientific advisors who wanted an evidence review report about how actually uh, to do it in the best way. And I'll stop here. Hey, well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I think I'm invited here because this one slide that I'm showing here is one slide presented at a meeting in Brussels earlier this year to do with carbon capture and utilization. We were only allowed to show one slide because of a, a large number of contributors <coughs> to that. So we had to summarize our involvement in that particular field. I'm not a politician, I'm a scientist. So I'm going to give you some idea of what input there was to that document a small part of the input to that document overall. Uh, let's see. I'm not used to PCs. <laughs> um, I'm going to skip that. I think most of us know about um, that sunlight is our major source of energy, whether that be coal, fossil fuels, uh, oil, as we use it now, or natural gas. It all derived from sunlight some considerable time ago. Uh, via this mechanism, conversion of CO2 and water to sugars, which are polymers of formaldehyde. What man does is simply convert, reconvert the work, the, the hard work that's been done by the plants, back into um, CO2 and water, and uses up oxygen in doing the process. Um, this is an important slide I wanted to show you. It's from somebody at University of Reading, Ed Hawkins, meteorology department there. And will it work? And it might not work on a PC. Slideshow mode. Slideshow mode, sorry. Ah, there we go. It shows the rise of CO2 in a rather unusual way, month by month from, I think it was about 1860 to now. You'll see near now it accelerates close to the 1.5 degree rise in tem global temperature, and that correlates with the rise in CO2 in the atmosphere. So hence the need for carbon capture and utilization and other technologies that will minimize um, the production of CO2 into the atmosphere, or even take it out of the atmosphere and start to reduce uh, 
the level again. The level was about 280 parts per million for a long, long geological time up till the invention of the Watt steam engine. And you can plot the graph. Soon after he invented that engine, there's a rise in CO2 in the atmosphere. Um, so, we look, we're all here thinking about a lot of uh, science policy advice to European governments and so forth. Um, there's a lot of new thinking going, out, going on, or is there? I just wanted to share two quotes from you, which would really be interesting. I put my money on the sun and solar energy. What a source of power it is. I hope we don't have to wait until oil and coal have run out before we tackle that. Who said that, I wonder? The, the inventor of the light bulb, Thomas Edison. He said that in 1931. Um, here's an even older quote. This is actually from a book um, in which it considers a society where there may be no more coal available. What will they burn instead of coal, asked Pencroft. Water, replied Harding, but water decomposed into its primitive elements. Yes, my friends, water will be used to make hydrogen and oxygen, which will be a fuel, uh, and it will water will be the coal of the future. And that's one of the areas that I work on. The person who said that, incredible prescience or pre-science, was Jules Verne in The Mysterious Island, his novel from 1874. Um, I'm going to skip that slide because we haven't got a lot of time, but we have the Paris Climate Agreement that defined we're going to try and minimise temperature rise on the Earth to less than two degrees, or we should do, for our own good, try to do that. Um, and that agreement was made, and you can see this graph shows that by 2030, China, India, EU, USA have dictated limits to their production, which is already more in 2030. It doesn't leave any room for the rest of the world for CO2 production. So even that agreement is rather um, limited, I would say. Uh, in terms of the UK, um, I want to emphasise the importance of wind. <coughs> Quite a lot of us have solar panels, they're useful, uh, but actually wind is the most efficient <coughs> form of utilisation of solar energy. Wind is solar energy. Um, this is, gives you an idea of renewable energy, about 50% is by wind in the UK at the moment. Uh, that is a fantastic website. For those of you who are maybe not scientists, David Mackay, who became a government science advisor, he was a Cambridge physicist, has a website called withouthotair.com. There's a free book there which explains the efficiency of different types of renewable energy and fossil fuel and nuclear, and without a doubt, wind is the most efficient in terms of money in to money out. So um, it's well worth reading. That's a very readable book. Um, so what's carbon capture and utilisation? This is a slide from 2014 from ChemSoc Review. It's called here Carbon Capture and Recycling because it involves various other aspects. But you can see um, here if we get CO2 from various types of industrial activity like steel plants, concrete manufacture, ammonia synthesis plants. You should all know about ammonia synthesis plants. We ran out of CO2 earlier in the year. There was a big a near crisis that we wouldn't have any beer. And the reason is ammonia synthesis plants are where the CO2 that you drink in your carbonated drinks comes from comes from ammonia synthesis chemical plants because rather pure CO2. It's fossil fuel CO2. Carbon comes from natural gas in that, but uh, that goes into your drinks. CO2 does have a value, a commercial value. But we're interested in taking this through to make a fuel again using hydrogen, which comes from wind or solar power by a process called electrolysis. So we use CO2 as a carrier to carry hydrogen which saves us burning coal and fossil fuel. Um, so this SAPIA report, as you heard, is report number two, Novel Carbon Capture and Utilisation Technologies, took input from a wide range of sources to consider the possibilities for new ways of using CO2 and minimising um, CO2 production into the atmosphere. And one of the ways of minimising that is by solar energy uh, production of electricity, you put that electricity through an electrolyzer and make hydrogen and oxygen. The hydrogen is the energy carrier. Because obviously wind and sun don't operate all the time. Sun obviously doesn't operate at night. There are periods when the wind is low. 
you have to store the energy when those outputs are high for use for when those outputs are low. And it's considered now that maybe the only way we can do that is by storage as a fuel. And the one we're interested in is methanol. There are other types of fuel, though, that we might want to use. And this was part of the input to this, um, to this process. I'm going to skip that definition. Um, one of the important things that goes into that uh, production of fuels from solar energy is a thing called catalysis. Some of you may not have heard of catalysis. Some of, most of you will have heard the word catalyst. It's used in all sorts of ways now. It's a scientific term. It was invented by a colleague of our previous speaker, a Swede called Berzelius in about 1850. So catalysis is a way that we can make chemicals using less energy and, and make them more quickly. And the asterisks there refer to people on the panel that fed in to this report who are catalysis experts. Those are the ones I know that are catalysis experts. You can see that quite a fraction of that panel come from the catalyst community. The food you ate this morning, the clothes you're wearing, the fuel you used to get here, whatever form that might have been, maybe you came by bike, in which case you didn't use a fuel maybe, but bits of your bike were made using this catalytic, uh, this process called catalysis. Very important technology. Um, so again, uh, the idea is that we um, take energy using electrolysis, we pass current through water, you can split the water into hydrogen and oxygen. Hydrogen is then a usable fuel, but it's a very light gas. We need to make it into a more dense form to transport it efficiently and to convert it efficiently. And one of those denser forms of fuel is methanol. And so we've been involved in a, a European project. Uh, it's a SPIRE project which combines several ac academic institutions across Europe and several uh, European uh, industrialists, one of the major ones being MHPSE, which none of you have probably heard of, but actually stands for Mis Mitsubishi Hitachi Power Systems Europe. They run most of Germany's coal-fired power stations and produce the CO2 that we need to use. So um, that, that was the plan. We're going to take uh, fuel out of a, uh, CO2 out of a power plant. That CO2 is a bit dirty. It's got some sulfur in it. It's got some nitrogen compounds in it, so we have to purify it. We take that CO into a methanol synthesis plant. That's made by our group colleagues in Iceland, a company called CRI, which is down there somewhere. Should be CRI, that one. Uh, that CO2 is reacted with the hydrogen from solar energy using electrolysis, and we make five, the aim is to make 500 tonnes a year of methanol. That probably sounds like quite a lot to you, but this is a demonstrator plant. The fossil fuel-powered methanol synthesis plants around the world, which are used at the moment, the carbon comes from natural gas predominantly, are typically a million tonnes a year. So this is a demonstrator that we can do this process using solar energy as the main input and CO2 as a carrier for that reduced carbon footprint hydrogen which is which is the important carrier and we were pleased to see july this year there's the <laughs> the concrete being leveled for the for this small plant to be put next to the, this all what's around it is a power a coal fired power station we're taking the co2 from there and making methanol as a demonstrator that we can use solar energy uh, to do this process and all that information fed in to the sapir process into that report and you can read those conclusions to yourself, for yourself, that some of them are a bit controversial. Uh, you and I have the biggest input to reducing CO2 into the atmosphere. You drive less miles per year in your car, you put less CO2 into the atmosphere. I advise you all to do that. Thank you. <laughs> Good afternoon. <laughs> good, you're still awake. <laughs> Always good to know. So, um, <laughs> no, I know. Should I ring the bell? Oh, it doesn't work for me. Never mind. <laughs> Only if it works for you, John. So, uh, krill and chips. Does everyone know what krill is? Fish. fish, yeah, yeah. Tiny, tiny little fish way down on the food chain. Um, so, I thought I should 
uh, try and talk to you about how we've bought a policy uh, document that was produced by Sapir and has been mentioned already today, the Food from the Oceans report, um, and try to engage a wider public with that. So I am a lecturer in science communication and engagement at Cardiff University based in the physics department and I also run an outreach uh, enterprise called, Social, called Science Made Simple and it's our role to try and connect the public with research and to inspire the next generation of scientists and engineers. And so Louise uh, came to us a few months ago and had this challenge, if you like, can we turn this 88 odd page report that's been written for the European Commission into something that will engage the public so that we can tell them what the European Commission are doing about this issue. And as science communicators, we were really excited about the challenge because it meant getting to grips with some really complex issues that weren't necessarily our own expertise and translating that into something that the public could engage with. So I want to talk to you about sort of what we did and what we learned during that process and hopefully that would be useful to think about how you might engage wider publics with your policy reports and your policy issues. Um, but before we start, I'd like to try an experiment. So everybody uh, in the audience, this is very simple, you don't need to move, you don't need any special equipment, all you need is your hand. Okay, take your hand. You have a hand? Yeah? Thank you. <laughs> Make a circle with your thumb and your finger. All right, now find something in the room, on the wall, maybe a beautiful painting, that fish eye is quite good. And using both eyes, with both eyes open, doesn't matter what you choose, just line it up in the centre of that circle for me. Okay? Once you've done that, now what I want you to do is to close your left eye and open it again. And then close your right eye and open it again. And try it a couple of times if it didn't work first time. Anyone notice anything happen? What happened? Just someone tell me. Dominant eye. Yeah, you have it. it tells you about your dominant eye, that's right. So when I close my left eye, for example, the <coughs> fish eye jumps right outside the circle. So what that really simple experiment tells me is that I have a dominant eye. So even if I have 20-20 vision and my eyes seem to be perfect, I still have one eye that tends to take in more information than the other. What's that got to do with uh, food from the oceans? <laughs> it's just an example, really, of how it's really important to start with the why it matters to people. Okay? Now, that might not matter to you, knowing what your dominant eye is, but you might tell someone else about that. You might tell someone how to do it. The fact that I tried to make it personal to you, humans are egotistical creatures. I don't mean that in a bad way, but we are very interested in things about ourselves. So the first key point to engaging the public with uh, perhaps complex policy issues is to make it personal to them. What can they do? What, why does it matter? So this was our first challenge. So I'd say put the why before the what. And as Ole said, this is an issue I didn't really know a lot about before we came to this project, <coughs> but the fact that the population of the Earth is growing is probably something a lot of people are familiar with, but the scale of it perhaps is something I didn't realise. This is why it's important. And there's a 60% increase in food demand by 2050. So as you can see from the screen, what we were doing is trying to pull out some of the key messages from the report, work with a graphic designer to turn them into nuggets and bite-sized bits of information in infographics that could be used on social media and on the leaflet, which I think is here at the Academia stand today, if you want to have a look at it in full. So the key thing is getting people to care, to see why it's important. Now, when you're involved in the science and the policy area, I think sometimes you're so immersed in it, you forget to step back and go, why does it matter to other people? So I even wondered if this is, but the better way to remember this is put the so what before the what. So before you start explaining to people what the science is and what the policy issues are, so what? Why should they care? Okay, so that is so important. And within the Food for the Oceans report, um, this was only a really tiny part of the report because obviously it's a foregone conclusion that the Commission know why it's important. Um, but it turned into quite a big part of the end leaflet because we, we said it was much important uh, to get that right. And this is where I think an external uh, partnership of some way can help you because when you're immersed in your own science, it's very hard to see what things uh, might matter to other people. So how might you find that out? Well, there are various places you could look. Um, the key thing is finding out what do the public care about, what do they think is important, and how can I tie my policy to those things? So you may have come across, I'm sure you've heard of the Eurobarometer survey, which is done across the 28 <coughs> member states. These are the things that the European public say they think uh, science and technology should be focusing on 
Uh, the blue is, they could say more than one thing, so the yellow is where they, it was their first answer and the blue is if they answered it at all. Um, but from things like that, you can see what kind of things people care about. And not surprisingly, often medical issues come out top because, as I say, we are caring for ourselves and we're caring for those medical issues which affect ourselves. So that's the European version. In the UK, the Wellcome Trust do a similar survey. This is obviously specifically about medical research topics. Um, and, you know, this is, which means they're obviously all medical things, but this gives you an idea of which are people interested in. So there are places out there to find that. And I I think you want to try and tie those things together, if you can, if it's not too tenuous, into your policy documents. Um, oh, let's just go back a sec before I put that on, if you weren't quick enough to read it. Put your hands up for me if you've ever heard of a trophic level. Louise is not allowed to do it. <laughs> trophic level. Okay, those of you with your hands up, how confident, would you be confident at explaining that quickly? To, if you're not involved in this research, so I can see someone else who's... No, not Dredging sure. Dredging it up from previous studies. Dredging it up. So sort of a distant memory, yeah? Would you like to have a go? What is it quickly to us? Sure. It's uh, the level in the... Um, it's hard, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> where, where you are on who eats what. Yes. Oh, that's lovely. I like that. Mm. So this is some of the first bits of jargon that we came across that was prolific in the Food for the Oceans report. And again, when you're a scientist working on that, why wouldn't you use that? It's a term that's well known in your field. So it's not a criticism. I think a lot of people are worried about engaging the public and it means that you have to dumb messages down. You don't have to dumb things down, but you do have to start a few steps away from where you want to be. And making something simple for someone to understand and engage with does might mean you lose detail, but it shouldn't mean you lose any accuracy. Okay, so you don't have to fear, if it's done well, that you're losing accuracy, but you, you will have to sacrifice some detail. So we came up, we tried to find a very visual way to explain what it meant, um, what trophic levels meant. So for the rest of you in the room who've never heard of them, like me, before I did this project, um, it is exactly what the gentleman said there, um, where you are and who eats what kind of thing. So this is an infographic we came up with to explain that as visually as we could with as few words as possible. So our brief for this job was really to produce something that worked in lots of languages but without there being a lot of translation to do on the text. So it was really about trying to find visual ways to do that. And as you can see at the moment, if you look at the ocean's food, we, we eat most of our food from the top two, uh, trophic level four and five. And in the farming agriculture, we eat from much lower down, T1 and T2. And that's why there has to be a shift. So I think when you see it like that, it's very clear to see that to balance that and to support the needs of the planet, we've got to kind of work at shifting those, both of those probably, but certainly with the oceans, shifting that something comes from further down the food chain. So explaining what you mean, obviously, before you start trying to inform people what you want them to do. Because if you start throwing around terms like trophic levels and people shut off, You've lost them as supporters, and that's really key. So a lot of the recommendations from Food for the Oceans, naturally, are to do with quite complex political issues, to do with mariculture and spatial planning and how we use the oceans and how we support new mariculture innovation. And all of those things are very distant from the person on the street. So although they were a big part of the policy, we didn't think they were really going to engage people um, very easily. So we did... Uh, recognised that people needed to see what the European Commission were going to do as a result of this report, but it wasn't a big part of what we decided to focus on, but it was there. Um, and you've just got to find where the people are, so as, as it says, find people within the policy. Then the fourth thing that I think is really important is asking the public to do something differently. So with this example, with this policy action report, we thought, what is it from this evidence the public can actually do? Yes, it might be the politicians who are making the policy change and who are making the rules, but if the public are going to engage in this issue at all, they need to feel empowered to do something with their behaviour that will make a difference. And that wasn't really the aim of the official report, but we needed people to look at the official report, so we're trying to get them to find a way in. Um, so we started looking at things like bite-size information they could get about these seafoods that were further down the trophic level, which in some cultures are very, are much more used than they are in sort of European culture. 
So we tried to pull out all the positives of these lower level trophic seafoods and encourage people perhaps to think about experimenting with them in their diet. Because at the end of the day, these are the people who can create a demand in the supermarkets and that can actually help shape policy. Yes, the public don't directly shape the policy, but if they start asking for lots of these products, that will help drive the policy makers. So it's really important that the public do get on side with that. And the final thing I'd say is that it's really important that uh, you know that you go to events like this or European events and there are flyers and leaflets galore. We desperately tried to think of some way to make sure that leaflet that you give someone hung around in their house for as long as possible. Because if it isn't there in front of them, it's in one ear and out the other. So this is very sort of, we thought of lots of ideas. Should, could we make it into a fish origami model? <laughs> could we make it into a fridge magnet that had a shopping list? Um, anything where you want people to kind of at least have it in their um, vicinity for as long as possible. What we ended up with is um, a sort of mindfulness colouring in sheets that they could do with their family and some of the key facts on there, which can be downloaded from the website so schools could use it. So it's a way of bringing in the education side and also it's downloadable as a poster. So although the main purpose was to make a hard copy leaflet, you can also download and put something up perhaps in your classroom or if you're interested in this area, it's all there. Um, looking fairly easy to digest, hopefully. So you want it to have a life. And obviously as well, you want people on social media to try and engage in the conversation. So you need to have one point of contact where people can kind of make comments and where they can find out more about the report. So I think with all these areas of European policy, there's a huge opportunity to find ways to kind of bridge that big report into something that the public can then get on side with and really generate a movement. I mean, you've only got to look at Blue Planet for the power of what the public can do in the way of changing policies. So I think if we do more of this, engaging the public and perhaps using people and performers at events, there's all sorts of face-to-face -face engagement I think could make a real difference into how these reports get disseminated. And uh, that's me. Brilliant. Tips. Thank you. Our penultimate speaker is Ian Curry. Right. Well, thanks for having me here today. I'm glad we're having an event like this in Swansea University. Uh, so I come at this from a public policy angle. I am a public policy scholar, I guess. Uh, and we've been working on a project called IMPACT that has a very nice, uh, it's a very nice acronym that actually just makes it look like we don't really know how to spell. Uh, but uh, we've been working, I've been working with colleagues in uh, some of the STEM subjects uh, to look at how better we can uh, get uh, scientific evidence into public policy at the Welsh level, but also at higher levels of government. And I think there are a lot of initiatives that try to do this, obviously. A lot of them are very top-down in their approach. And I want to work with the actual researchers on trying to do this from the bottom up and getting more uh, STEM, uh, STEM researchers thinking about public policy all throughout their work, not just sort of as an end stage uh, in the process. So what issues do affect the use of scientific research in, in policy? Some of the presenters today have already discussed some of these, uh, but you know, the, the famous to the point of it's getting a little old, uh, Michael Gove quote about how Britain has had enough of experts, uh, shows that there are uh, some problems with the linkage between scientific expertise, uh, its use in policy, and also what the public thinks of this. Uh, to be a little provocative as well, I think we also have to ask what role scientific evidence should play. Should it be involved in all policy making? How should it be all involved in all policy making? You can already see a bit of shift in the politics realm away from evidence-based policy making to this idea of evidence-informed policy making, which is already starting to downplay the importance of scientific evidence a little bit. And that leads into whether there are limitations to the usefulness of an incorporating scientific evidence and uh, how it can be used to enhance the democratic uh, process. So why isn't scientific evidence used more properly or used more often in policy making? 
Well, Paul Kearney up in Sterling has done a lot of work on this. I highly recommend reading his blog for more information on the use of evidence in policy making. And he raised, he's raised some issues that uh, do factor into this. The first is that uh, policy making is inherently political. And this goes beyond, you know, the more uh, clinical, I suppose, approach to research. And uh, there needs to be this recognition that it goes beyond simple evidence as well. And there are political concerns that need to be taken into account. And there are other issues that feed into this policy process. Another one is this uh, idea of reactivity versus proactivity. I think uh, both sides can be a bit guilty of being reactive to research. Uh, you know, if you look from the academic side, there can be a, uh, an emphasis on publishing findings. You know, that's the only time you engage with policy, whereas maybe it should uh, happen earlier in the process. Uh, from the politicians and policymaker side, there can be this idea that you only start searching for evidence once you have an idea you want to push forward. Um, there's also differing views of what constitutes good evidence. So whether this evidence, uh, obviously, you know, speaking from a researcher's perspective, there is this idea that good evidence should be peer-reviewed publications in good journals. Politicians often, and policymakers often take a much wider view of what constitutes good evidence, looking at the gray literature out there, looking at other sources, not to mention things like public opinion. Um, there's also the, the problem of bounded rationality and heuristics. Uh, you know, so this is system one thinking, for those of you who are familiar with uh, Kahneman and Tversky, where there is this overemphasis on, on sort of relying on cognitive shortcuts uh, when you're making policy, and that doesn't always bring in all the evidence to the extent we'd want. And finally, there's the question of who actually controls the policy process. Uh, you know, in a globalized world, this is becoming a lot more complex where there isn't that straight line between politics and policy making that there used to be. You know, there's many more actors involved with the process. There's many more things that need to be taken into account. And all of these things make it actually much more difficult for us as researchers to even sometimes identify who we can talk to uh, to get our research out there. So what can we do? Um, I've broken this up into looking at what academics can do, but also what policymakers can do. So what can academics do? Well, first we have to highlight the relevance of our research. Uh, you know, so this comes back to, to really what Wendy was talking about as well, is we need to tell policymakers why they should care about what we're doing. It may be self-evident to us, but it's not always self-evident from a policy perspective that uh, why, why this research should feed into that process. There's also a need to engage with the public. You know, it's one thing to convince politicians that something needs to be done, but where the power can really come in is convincing the public that something needs to be done. You know, that's where you get this groundswell that your research actually matters. Um, you know, I mean, uh, a lot of us may hate the uh, REF impact measures. You know, they, they can be a real uh, pain sometimes, but I think it's a move in the right direction to recognize that academic research needs to have this real world impact instead of just being about uh, well peer reviewed um, publications. I think we also need to explore different ways of dissemination. You know, so how we get this research out there and also when we get this research out there. You know, it, again, it's not just about doing this at the end of your research, it's about looking at it throughout the process. It's engaging with all the stakeholders, so not just government, but look at uh, you know, non-governmental organizations that are involved, think tanks that are involved, and seeing if that's a more useful way to get your message out there. I think you need to understand the policy process as well. You know, we, we often, well, or maybe it's just me, uh, complain about how maybe politicians don't understand the academic process. Well, I think we also have a responsibility to understand the political process, you know, and understand where we can feed into it uh, the best. Pick your battles, it's another important one. And this, uh, this also relates to a question I think we all need to ask ourselves as academics as whether we're going to be advocates or whether we're going to be more neutral arbiters 
in uh, getting our research out there. I don't think there's a right answer to that question, but I think whichever direction you take, you know, has different implications with how you work in the policy realm. And finally, uh, you know, it's a buzzword, but it's an important one I think we need uh, to make more use of interdisciplinary approaches to address these cross-cutting policy issues. There's been some nice work done actually by the European Commission and a lot of its research grants where it is um, embedding social sciences into its research programs as a way to show that you need to look at social relevance as well as scientific relevance when you're developing your research programs. So what can policymakers do? I think there needs to be, I should also mention a lot of this comes from an event we had last year around this time, uh, an impact event on uh, um, uh, the role of evidence in policy making. And so a lot of these I have uh, the participants in that to thank for coming up with these ideas. So I think there needs to be more of a recognition of the um, speed or the, the slow nature of academic research sometimes, where if you want good quality evidence, it does take time. Um, what you get uh, for that loss of time is more thorough, more in-depth research. Uh, there's also this recognition of cro the cross-cutting nature of research, but also public policy. Um, you know, and, and I guess related to that, the fact that uh, as researchers, we often have a lot of other responsibilities, teaching, administration, that can cut into the time we spend on this. There is a need to go beyond the usual suspects. I think that's a problem that can occur with some of these top-down approaches is uh, it's the world-renowned professors who get to ask to contribute. Of course, they have a lot to contribute. I'm not trying to take that away from them, but so do early career researchers. You know, get us before we become old and cynical. Um, I mean, I'm working very hard to become both old and cynical, but you know. Um, I think there is this need to work with all researchers. You know, you can sometimes get some things that are a little more cutting edge, a little more uh, you know, um, thought through, uh, also people who really want to engage but don't always get the chance. So there is this need to go beyond those usual suspects. Um, there needs to be, I think we need to be made aware of these avenues of influence as well. We're not always aware of all the um, things that are going on, all the initiatives that are undertaken with uh, government, you know, um, in legislatures to involve uh, scientists in the research. Uh, some of that's our own fault as academics, but I think there's also that need to push and to let people know, let universities know what avenues are out there. And then finally, there needs to be, a, you know, and this is a big challenge, especially in today's political climate, that there needs to be this proper engagement with research. It can't just be this headlines, this cherry picking. You, there needs to be a more thorough engagement with this research. And that goes back to what I said about it needing to be throughout the policy process instead of just at the end. So what can we do together? Let's bring this uh, uh, into a nice big group hug. Um, so there's the importance of the relationships and, and really iterative and ongoing interaction between the two groups. So a lot of it still comes down to talking, you know, knowing people, being able to interact with people, you know, events like this that bring people together. We should uh, institutionalize these avenues, so relationships are important, but we need those institutionalized, both politically but also in academia. Uh, universities need to recognize this. Um, we need to reconcile both uh, the supply side and the demand side, so what, pol what uh, public policymakers want and also what we can give as academics. And also recognize the short and long-term implications of involving uh, research in, in policy making, knowing that it's, uh, it's not all to the political cycle. Sometimes these things take time and uh, you know, hopefully uh, if we, we do all that, then uh, we can work together more freely. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
much. I know those of you that have got a question for Peter are extremely keen to ask it, so I'll try my best to keep to the, the 10 minutes allotted. Um, looking at the panel and making some assumptions about the audience and that you were roughly like us, I assume that not everybody would be um, terribly familiar with sociology of science and science and technology studies. So what I thought I would start off with is just a quick overview of kind of where I'm coming from um, and the kinds of questions and debates that animate the work that I do. And then just give you three or four things to think about really as a way of framing how we might ask questions about what is the nature of expertise, what is the nature of science, how might it relate to policy, how might it relate to decision making and so on. And actually end up in a place that's not too far away from where Peter ended up, funnily enough. Um, but we'll see how we go. So in terms of science studies, I mean this is a a bit of a simplification, but there's been kind of three, three ways of thinking about it, of which what I've called wave two in the middle there is probably the mainstream version of it, and what I'm arguing for is the one that I've called wave three there on the end, which is a slightly um, different, different version of it. The, the wave one is kind of, kind of a straw man, but I think there's been hints of it um, in what we've heard from other speakers today. I mean, Peter certainly referred to it as a kind of ideal type mythical version of the, of the sort of the imagined relationship between science and policy that he was keen to, to get away from the idea that science presents some kind of um, autonomous objective truth um, and this is just transmitted to um, lay people and policy makers and their job is just to, just to receive it and act upon it but there's only one group of people that know what's going on and that's the scientists and they're the ones that are above the line. Wave two is the kind of social constructivist turn which argues that really epistemically there's nothing special going on in science um, and that what you really have is just whatever beliefs particular cultural groups choose to hold as being reliable and valid. And for a moment I thought that's where Wendy was going with her dominant eye thing because you could think about not so much the dominant eye but a dominant cultural eye and depending which cultural eye you look through you may or may not see the same thing and there's a kind of cultural argument that, that science has that kind of dominant empirical eye tells us what we ought to see when we look at the world and what happens then is that other ways of seeing other things that people might think are important get silenced by the power of that that dominant eye and so the wave two is very much about democratizing science and policy advice giving uh, in order to you know, blur this boundary between science and other ways of knowing and therefore give more epistemic rights to other communities so that their um, their, their views count equally to science. Um, and that gives rise to the post-normal science stuff that, that Peter referred to very briefly um, in his talk. I think the concern that I have and the, that me and Harry have with that particular way is that it's very difficult from that position then to say, well, why might you want to give special weight to science as opposed to any other particular way of knowing or any other particular claim about the nature of the world? And what we're trying to do, what we've called the wave three version, is to say, well, what criteria are there that we might use? And the criteria that we're starting with are, are twofold, really. One is to do with this nature of experience. So um, people who have experience of studying or investigating or interacting with a particular domain, they're the ones that are going to have expertise on some, some matter. Um, so, but that doesn't necessarily restrict you to thinking of scientists as being the only experts. I suppose that's one kind of thing I'd point to in what we've taught, heard so far is that almost everybody has assumed that the only people with advice to give are scientists. There's been very little mention of the contribution that people who have expertise but not scientific, not scientific training might make to these processes of advice giving. So what we're trying to do with these um, little pockets of expertise from amongst the sort of the lay community or the unqualified community is to point out you know, the possibility for you know, expert patients, um, local community groups and so on to generate expertise that could be scientific in terms of the adjective but not necessarily produced by scientists. And in that sense these groups of people might be as relevant and as expert as the certified scientists and more so than other kinds of scientists. So to give an example, if we imagine the theoretical physicist is over here and there's some kind of medical scientist over here, the patients are more like a peer group for the medical scientists than your theoretical physicist might be. Your theoretical physicist, with respect to public health, diabetes and so on, is effectively a layperson. The science qualification counts for very little there in our view. Okay, just a slight digression. How we get out of them the problem that you're thinking, well, why do they care about science at all? How do you recognise it? Our argument is that really you look at the values of science rather than the methods of science. And so there's some overlap with democratic values. Um, 
So there are certain things that are common to both, but there are also certain things that are different. So science as a, as a culture, as a form of life, has practices, particularly you know, replicability, observation, falsification, and so on, that make it different from mm -hmm. democratic societies. And then this, in turn, gives you a value-based rationale to defend science. So if you want to believe that science is more true than everything else, then fine, you can. I don't think you've got much ground for um, believing that. But if you want to believe it as an act of faith, that's fine. But these are other reasons that you can also argue um, give you a good reason to support or give weight to science as part of the system of checks and balances within broader society. Okay, so the norms themselves are important and you can make a value-based argument that just generating knowledge in this way is better. It is better to test things, it is better to be open to scepticism, it is better to be open to criticism than not to be any of those things. Um, so with those in mind, science is kind of defined in this kind of way, then there are a couple of things that we can think about. How might expertise and policy making fit together? So we can identify scientific as being things that correspond to this sort of area of the diagram over here. Um, I think one of the things that we've tended to talk about in the discussions today has been in this sort of terms of the sandwich model. We've talked about what we're calling the downstream side of things. So how do we disseminate information about science to policymakers and to the public in order that they better understand the things that they need to know in order to make good decisions and be proper citizens? Um, and again, that's part of the hint back or the echoing of the wave one stuff that I've heard. I think in this sort of sandwich model, we're trying to have a more kind of circular model because obviously the society that is downstream that we're disseminating information to is also the same society that's at the top of the sandwich um, in this diagram that ought to be involved in framing scientific research as well. So there's the informing stuff that lots of people have mentioned, but I think in terms of having been informed about the science, Part of the things that we might want to think about how people do that and how society gets involved, what policy makers do, is also to, in terms of framing scientific research, what kinds of questions, research programs, priorities do we set for our scientists? Do we let them decide these things for themselves? Do we try to steer them down particular, particular pathways? And how might, might we decide to strike the balance between those two, those two things? So it's not just about... Um, disseminating the kinds of information that scientists have chosen to, to bless us with. So that's kind of our, our sandwich model, just trying to think about it in different, different stages with science and expertise being, being in the middle. That said, um, in the book that's on the, the stand over there, we have been particularly concerned with these downstream mediating institutions, the idea of how might you get scientific advice um, into society or into policy-making processes. And our, our argument focusing purely on, on the downstream thing, um, is that there is a role for scientific advisors, people will be glad to know, um, and those sorts of, of organisations. I guess where we differ slightly from the way in which it's being conceived at the moment, I think we would want to, going back to that very first diagram, be more open to heterogeneous kinds of expertise within those expert advisor groups, whether they have to be constituted purely and solely by scientists or whether other scientists are also, or other forms of expertise are also relevant. And that, to some extent, gets back to the dominant eye thing. Depending on who you invite into your um, expert committee, you can imagine a range of more or less um, broad-ranging scrutiny gets, gets applied, more, more, more or less assumptions will get tested, and different um, range of tests will be suggested as, as being relevant. So the more broadly conceived you think of as your expert community, the more imaginatively you can frame the task that's, that's being set to them, then um, we're saying that's a, that's a, that's a bonus. Um, it may be then that you end up with slightly less consensus because you're no, no longer focusing on such a, narrow, such a narrow question, but that in itself might be a good thing. Because the other thing I've I've noticed about the, the scientific advice that we've, we've heard about today is the, the, the impression I've got is it's all been quite consensual and there isn't really very much um, disagreement between the scientists about what it is we need to do. And I wonder how representative of the kinds of policy debates that people are involved in and the choices that policymakers are making that actually is. Um, I, John hints at it in the t title of your talk, you know, um, where well you've, you've explicitly flagged up uncertainty and controversy. I mean, yours was political uncertainty, I think you were referring to. But there's also kind of technical and scientific uncertainty. Um, and so we need to think about how that gets represented. And I suppose we're, we're, our, our concrete proposal, I guess, would be that 
The way in which we would change scientific advice, I guess, would be in three ways. We would constitute the committees more broadly. We would focus um, more, emphasis, more attention on the idea of consensus. So rather than trying to resolve the dispute, what we would be saying, the point of the scientific advice is to say, what's the nature of the consensus? What do people agree about? What do they disagree about? And crucially then, to give some kind of um, assessment of the strength of that consensus. It seems to me that that's kind of important. Um, so I mean, Brexit is a good example of this, um, where you have very, very, apparently very, very precise economic predictions being made for a 30-year time frame, when clearly that's nonsense. Nobody knows what's going to happen in 30 years, but it's presented as if this is, this is inevitable. And it seems to me that that kind of knowledge should have a different sort of impact on policy making than somewhere the, um, the strength of the consensus is, is very, very high. Um, and so this is then where we end up being very, very close to Peter. Um, in terms of how this affects helps us think about how we might relate expertise to policy making. Wave one is very much a kind of technocratic approach. Can the policy makers den deny the legitimacy of expert advice? No, they can't because science is the best. It's objectively true. There's no way in which it could possibly be wrong. Of course you've got to listen to it. So that gives you a very, very sort of top-down science-led form of decision making, which is kind of there as a straw man, but I think there are, there are hints of it in the way people sometimes talk about science and, ex and policy advice. The wave two gets you to this kind of technological populism, which when we invented the term back in 2002 was a kind of um, hypothetical entity. We didn't really think things would get as bad as they have actually got. Um, Trump kind of embodies this in the way in which policy making in America is, is kind of being done at the moment. Can, can you deny the legitimacy of expert advice? Yeah, you can. You can just shut down the agencies. Um, you can say, it's just an opinion. I've got some alternative facts. I mean, we never thought that would happen. It was a kind of thought experiment that if you push social constructivism to the limit, this was where you would end up. Um, and obviously then, policymakers can refuse to act on expert advice because it's got no, no particular status. So the kind of position that we want to argue for, what we've dubbed as elective modernism in the book, is can you deny the legitimacy of expert advice? No, because... We can show there are criteria by which we can identify scientific ways of knowing, and we can produce grounds for saying these are preferable to non-scientific ways of knowing. But then this is where I end up being in the similar camp to, to Peter. Can policymakers refuse to act on that advice? Well, of course they can. They're policymakers. That's their, that's their prerogative and their role is to make those decisions. The only constraint that we would put on that is that what expert advice ought to do is restrict the reasons that they can give for justifying their, their policy choice. So, for example, if the scientific advice outcome is that there is a very, very strong consensus about some topic, policymakers should not justify a different policy on the basis that there's a controversy, because there isn't one, and so they, can have, they have to justify it on some other grounds. Conversely, and this is kind of where the Brexit example is relevant, where there is a wide-ranging controversy and no particular consensus. We would say that policymakers should not be justifying policies on the basis that there is no alternative because there clearly are lots of alternatives and that's how scientific advice relates to policymaking. Not as determining the actions but as placing limits on how it can be justified. And that's the end. Thank you. Well, ladies and gentlemen, the original plan was half an hour of conversation and discussion and debate and general venting. Uh, and I propose we continue with this. But some of you will, of course, have appointments uh, elsewhere. So if you need to leave, don't, don't be embarrassed. Just, just leave. Perhaps, Peter, you have a, a meeting this afternoon, I think, somewhere? Yeah, I do. Yeah. Yes, and, and so on in, in, in town. Um, Louise, you look as if you have so something. Turn off the recording equipment so ah, yes. carry on, ignore me. Right. So mm -hmm. now. Now we can let rip. So, would anyone, oh, if you do have a comment, statement, yeah. announcement, perhaps you'd say who you are uh, and address.